Hi there, I'm Dr. Anand. Welcome to my YouTube channel and our ongoing discussion about psychiatric disorders. In this episode, we want to talk about schizophrenia and the related psychotic disorders. I have been an inpatient psychiatrist for most of my career, and so I can definitely say I have treated a lot of psychotic disorders, including and especially schizophrenia. Now this is a scary word for a lot of people and it's again used in the media without much thought. A lot of people think schizophrenia means split personality. Nothing could be further from the truth. Actually schizophrenia comes from the term schizo which is to cleave, phrenia to think, otherwise known as a kind of broken brain. In other words the brain is fragmented and there are various authors that go back into the past that describe various manifestations and they're very famous and I don't want to go into a history lesson here but they describe very clear manifestations of schizophrenia. Obviously over the centuries it has evolved in its descriptive aspects and in the treatment but to give you in a nutshell Schizophrenia is a very serious, persistent, and lifelong mental disorder that really is associated with the notorious past, as it were, of the psychiatric profession. I think when one watches movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or movies about serial killers or others, one kind of confuses schizophrenia with all these dangerous acts when in fact the vast majority of people with schizophrenia are more vulnerable to others danger than being dangerous themselves. And I'll talk about in a future video about dangerousness and behaviors and violence and schizophrenia. The purpose of this video today is to really just give you the basics. So schizophrenia consists of two or three different manifestations. One of these is a break from reality, also known as psychosis. And psychosis is broken down, and nicely so I think in the DSM, into several key components. One of these is hallucinations. Hearing things that are not there. Now this can be confused with voices in your head, etc. And clearly these are so influential that they may influence you whether you eat, whether you draw, whether you talk to a person, not talk to a person. And it takes some experience, of course, to realize that they're psychotic and not just your own thoughts. The other one is delusions. These are fixed, false beliefs. People may think they're king of the world. They may think they're president of the United States. Other delusions may be much more bizarre, such as laser beams coming out of the moon and coming into your stomach. You know, I've heard all sorts of weird and wonderful stories that we would call bizarre delusions that are clearly fantastical and have nothing to do with reality, but they're very real for the patient. When I'm training students, for example, I often say to them, please don't write denies delusions for what the patient's telling you because by definition, delusional patients deny delusions. If for them, it's their reality. At other times, the patient may manifest two other aspects of psychosis, which include disorganization. Disorganization specifically in their behaviors or their speech. This has been described very richly in older textbooks with terms such as catatonia, whereby the person is kind of seized up or they maybe have odd movements. At other times they may be disorganized in their thinking. People talk about, you know, night's move thinking and they're doing elaborate German terms around from medical school and residency about the type of what we call thought disorder. Suffice it to say, the thinking is sometimes disorganized, rambling, going off the point. That's different to someone who's going on and on and on and not getting to the point, but can do if you redirect them. Some people are like that. But schizophrenia is clearly a very disorganized thinking, which reflects the level of a disorganization in the brain, which affects the kind of linear grasp of reality. So those are what we call psychotic symptoms. And they're usually very obvious and they come to attention fairly quickly. Sometimes the psychotic symptoms are less obvious. Some delusions are not so bizarre. Some people might be convinced that they have a serious disease. That's not a delusion, unless it's very fixed and false. In the old days, we used to call that hypochondriasis. Now we call it illness anxiety disorder. It's an unusual preoccupation. Some people may feel very strongly about something. That's called an overvalued idea. You know, that's a political persuasion or an ideology. That doesn't mean that they are delusional. Delusional is a frank break from reality, which is driven by a mental illness that even people around you or society just does not recognize. There are very rare cases of something called a folie a deux, also known as a shared delusional belief that members of a group may together have a very well caught an impaired grasp of reality. But that again, I want to emphasize, is extremely rare. Now remember, psychotic symptoms can also be manifestations of other disorders if they're severe enough. So for example, in a previous video, I talked about in bipolar one disorder in severe manic episodes, one can become psychotic. In those cases, they have what we call mood congruent. In other words, because they're euphoric, they think they're king of the world. Or 
if they're psychotic in a depression, because they're so depressed, their bowels must be destroyed. They have died inside. So these are very, very related to the mood and the congruity. In schizophrenia, interestingly, the delusions are not necessarily mood congruent, they are mood incongruent. They may have a depressed mood, but the nature of the delusion may be totally unrelated to the mood itself. So they're what we call mood incongruent. I'm sometimes we're tested in the exams about the mood incongruency or congruency. I don't want to get too academic about that. But there are certain features that are kind of classic to schizophrenia. Hallucinations are typically voices, but sometimes they can be what we call somatic delusions. They can be certain feelings of things crawling on you. Again, they're not limited to schizophrenia, but hallucinations are typically voices or hearing things. They may more rarely be seeing things. And the more bizarre the hallucination, whether you're responding to a funny taste or smell or sound or vision, the more likely we are to think about things like brain tumors or epilepsy than we are for schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is very much a diagnosis of exclusion. It doesn't mean you have to have a brain scan in order to rule out all the other things because that would be unwieldy and impractical. Usually there's a long history of kind of a decline from a certain level. In the beginning they may have what we call a prodrome, they may be kind of somewhat withdrawn. We oftentimes see this in early to mid-adolescence or early adulthood, where they're kind of not the same as they used to be. Their functioning is not the same, they're not outward, they're not as sociable and outward, they become more bizarre, much more odd in their behaviors, presentation, you know, there really is something wrong. And it may be complicated by use of substances, in particular cannabis or marijuana. And the debate has oftentimes been about, is this a marijuana-induced or cannabis-induced psychosis? But I think it's fair to say that there is a prodrome, there is kind of a period whereby there's a kind of a slow evolution of these increasingly odd and bizarre behaviors, thinking, that has become very apparent to the people around the person. In the beginning, one may attribute that to depression, one may attribute that to anxiety, obviously taking a history matters. But sometimes because they're so paranoid, they may not want to volunteer what they're thinking. In the old DSM-4, there were actually four different types of schizophrenia which I think was actually more helpful. Now it's been lumped in the DSM-5 into just schizophrenia. But for example, patients I've treated in the past sometimes kind of met the criteria of what we call a paranoid schizophrenia. And those schizophrenias, in their day-to-day, -day, they look perfectly appropriate. They just had what we call this encapsulated or kind of sealed off delusion that I don't know, they were president of the United States. But in their day-to-day -day behavior, they would come for their medications, they would participate appropriately in games and activities on the unit, they wouldn't have any fights with people, they would be likable, but they would have this chronic, what we call stable, non-bizarre delusion. So that was oftentimes referred to as paranoid schizophrenia, and it was hard to distinguish that from something called a paranoid personality disorder, where someone's just much more wary of others' motives and misreads into things. And so that was the debate when that subcategory existed. Other more elaborate schizophrenias were the disorganized schizophrenia, where somebody was just simply like, you know, so out of it, they would just like look quote unquote crazy because they were saying bizarre things, doing bizarre behaviors, and they were called the disorganized schizophrenias. Then there was simple schizophrenia where they just basically wasted away, so to speak, in their behaviors and their interactions without hallucinations, without illusions. That was called a simple schizophrenia. And eventually, most people with schizophrenia, and it's been described over the years, without treatment, may have incurred the second half of this disease in later life which is what we call the neurodegenerative aspects, which is almost like a dementia. They'll forget, they'll be babbling to themselves, they really don't know how to eat, do their buttons, they've lost interest in things, they lack initiative, it looks like a depression sometimes, sometimes people will attribute it to side effects, but it's kind of a natural part of the evolution of many people with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a really broad term. I do not want you to get the impression that everybody's schizophrenia looks exactly the same and it's going to end up in exactly the same way. That's certainly not true. In the old days, anybody with schizophrenia was basically put into a long-term psychiatric hospital and left there. And that was where the profession of psychiatry acquired a notorious reputation and all these stereotypes of the asylums and you know, one view of the cuckoo's nest, that's where they come from. And it was a very unfortunate a part of the history because oftentimes they were used to experiment on, like lobotomies and ECT. And that's a very, very unfortunate stigmatizing aspect to the disorder. And I think that the that word may need to be revised moving forward because people have some very, very stigmatized associations with that word schizophrenia, when in fact, it is such a heterogeneous umbrella 
of different diagnoses. From my experience of having treated schizophrenia in the hospital and in the outpatients, one can actually see people who function and thrive out there in the community. They may have hallucinations, they may have delusions, but as long as they have help and they're adequately treated with medications, they can actually have a pretty good quality of life. And there are skills that every adult, and I've talked about this in previous videos, that every adult needs to acquire, and them especially. And so there will be sometimes day programs where they learn computer skills, you know, they'll learn job applications, etc., how to cook, how to take care of themselves. And these are very, very important, especially so because the cognitive aspect, the thinking aspect, the initiative, the wherewithal, is a very much a slow decline as the person ages with the disorder. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I think one of the things that has revolutionized the treatment of schizophrenia, of course, has been the newer antipsychotic agents. People probably have stereotypical views of what Haldol and Thorazine, the old medications used for schizophrenia, did to patients. And for example, there is this term called the Thorazine shuffle, whereby the public used to see patients drooling or shuffling outside the hospital ward or the, the grounds of the hospital. And it was very disturbing to watch and I can imagine disturbing for the patient to go through that because the older antipsychotics had what we call extra pyramidal side effects. In other words, they looked like Parkinson's disease. They would shuffle in their gait, they would drool, they would have a very kind of mask-like face that didn't change much. And it was very much added to the stereotype of the limitations of schizophrenia because these medications would not help the, what we call the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, the ones whereby they lack wherewithal and it gets worse, the cognitive symptoms they are now known as, you know, that impair their functioning more actually than the psychotic symptoms did because the psychotic symptoms could well be treated. They were actually successfully treated with things like Haldol and Thorazine. However, the good news is that since the 1970s and 80s, we've had an explosion of different medications called the second generation antipsychotics, such as Seroquel, such as Risperdal, Olanzapine, Geodon. I'm giving the trade names, but you know, other names of them are Cotiapin, Risperidone, Ziprazidone, Olanzapine. So these are the second generation antipsychotics, which revolutionize treatment actually. I hope this is helpful and practical for you and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you for any feedback. Thank you for your support of the channel thus far and stay healthy and I'll see you soon.